my dream is to move from big city to a small city so I be my own boss be independent watch my kids growing go to school come back home safe uh, the people really love Arkansas and this part of the country uh, because uh, you go to a creek you can still see the water being crystal clear you can still see the rocks underneath the water uh, that's similar to life in, in Laos we are originally from China and but we are not Chinese Hmong is the free man top mountain top people independent people they were used to uh, being originally farm families in, the, in, in Laos, in the country that they came from. They were, uh, you know, brought up raising pigs and, and sheep and goats and, and, and fowl, uh, such as chickens and ducks and, and geese. And uh, they wanted to get back to that type of, of life, if possible. During the Vietnam War, Laos became a war zone. Although the country was supposed to be neutral, communist forces used the Ho Chi Minh Trail through northeastern Laos to transport war supplies to South Vietnam. This was right in the middle of where the Hmong lived. Major General Vang Pao of the Royal Lao Army was of Hmong origin. The CIA trained Hmong guerrilla fighters under his charismatic leadership and supplied them with weapons in the so-called secret war in Laos. If the war is going on in this valley, then we moved to a different valley, and my brothers and my dad were protecting us, you know. So if we move all over, gunfire all over our head. I didn't fight, my, but my father, my uncle, they fought, and my my father was killed by the uh, North Vietnamese, and my uncle was killed. Each time they moved to a different village, and the North Vietnamese come closer, then they moved to another one, and they moved to the, an, another one. I refuge look at three times as the refugees in Laos. When I was nine years old, my, uh, the commander of my region already taught children at nine years old how to operate carabine gun, M16 gun and how to uh, watch out for grenade. And so we, we were taught about the enemy's uniform. And should we see one with that uniform, our job is to kill. Children and the women and a few adult men were at the village protecting the village while the men went out to the front to fight. Yeah, when the U.S. pulled out and General Rand Powell first flew off in Laos to Thailand, then we started escape from walking because all my family are being in the army. So we just started moving on foot, you know, on foot, trying to make a cross to Thailand. I was a little young kid. And then when we got, finally we got to close to uh, Vientiane there, you know, the capital, we got, shot by the, by the by the Lao army. I remember when I, I just can't run, I remember those uh, army just kicking people left to right behind me. And me and my brother just holding my hand and we start running away from it, you know, and yeah. And all of a sudden my brother, my brother-in-law, my sister, they all disappeared, just two of us. So we just followed the crowd. What it's important and I always remember in my life, it's the more than 30 days that we have to travel from Laos to Thailand. During that trip, I saw lots of people dead. A lot of friends that we traveled together do not make it. A family of my brother's friends completely wiped out. Just only the husband arrived. The rest of the family members, about six people, could not make it. They got, some got drunk in the river. Some, they could not swim to so the uh, 
uh, two kind of flow back to Laos and the soldiers shot, shoot them. Ultimately, about 40,000 Hmong reached Thailand by the end of 1975, only to spend months or years in refugee camps before being allowed to come to the United States. Tens of thousands more arrived in Thailand in subsequent years. As of 2011, Laos is still communist, and there are still reported persecutions of the Hmong who stayed. The refugee camps in Thailand have been closed. Once in the United States, it was a hard adjustment to go from a farm life without electricity or running water to a modern urban lifestyle, especially without speaking the language. Remember Sesame Street? Sesame Street is a big help to me. I turn it on, I learn A, B, C, and one, two, three, you know, I mean, from Sesame Street. Life is a horrible because you're going to, I'm the first one in Appleton West, first monk. And, you know, you got some friend, you got some not, not a friend, you know, you got some people who really don't like you. You know, I mean, they bump on you, they bully you. And... In addition, many were relocated to Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minnesota, to Wisconsin, and elsewhere with cold northern climates, far different from the Laotian highlands, and most ended up in urban areas. Why in the world put, I, I am put here? You know, where's my mountain? Where's my water? Where's, where's my river? Uh, where, where do I see the cattle, you know? But the worst part was being separated from family members. But I mean, it's a, it's a culture shock. I was thinking, am I over, am I gonna have, you know, or have time to, to come back and see my country and see this thing anymore, you know? I mean, it's just emotionally going through you and the people you left behind, like my brother, like my father, and I haven't just, you know, left the country, but you left a lot of peace of mind and loved one behind. It's now been about 30 years since those early relocations. Children who came have become adults with their own families. They've been educated in the U.S and have assimilated to the American, mostly urban, lifestyle. But there has been a dream to return to their agricultural roots and find a lifestyle more akin to that which they left. And in 2002 and following years, many relocated to the Ozark Mountains. The first time I take my girl, my, my youngest girl, to uh, visit the farm, uh, at Lincoln, she asked for, where's Burger King? I said, well, we have to go to Fayetteville. She said, why so far? Why can't we just walk a few blocks and see Burger King and McDonald's? Sometimes I've had as many as 19 people standing on this front porch at, at 5.30 in the morning in, in three to four minivans, and we would just uh, head out uh, in a carpool with uh, all the folks following me, and we would see you know four to five farms all the way from the Madison County, where I'm at, to uh, the Oklahoma line, to the edge of Missouri, or over into Missouri. The move by the Hmong to the Ozarks coincided with the housing bubble in the U.S. economy. Credit was easy, and the first arrivals did not always know what they were getting into when they purchased a poultry farm. When I first came down here to look in poultry farm, we just pick at the chicken house and look at that, and then look at the poultry grower, and then say, what this old man can do, I can do too. And you know? so they didn't even think of how hard it is and how difficult you have to work on it. Third people who fell is where they bought a very old farm, which is needed to be upgraded to the standard. But nobody told them. The realtor, the banks, the USDA, then they didn't tell anybody. Like my my friend moved down here. The first, when we moved down here the second year, they come down to visit to see they want to buy farm to, and we told them, it's best for you to build a new poultry house, and that's what they did, and they do lots better than us. We had to come here and buy the old poultry house, and you had to fix a lots of things in there. 
So the farmer just strictly say, okay, I have a hundred thousand, hundred fifty thousand dollar down payment. Can you give me the farm? And they just say, yeah, and get a, a, a long approval. And that's it. Then as soon as they start operating, then the chicken company come along and say, hey, you need to put new fans, you need to put a curtain, you need to put a solid wall, you need to put motor here, which is going to cost another $150,000, $80,000. And the farmer says, I can't do it. They say, well, if you can't do it, we're not going to send you chickens. With the recession, the dream became a nightmare for many. With increased energy costs and banks tightening loan restrictions, it was even more difficult to make a profit. Families lost their farms to bankruptcy and foreclosure. This has caused many to return to where they came from or find other means of income. For many, the move to Northwest Arkansas was irreversible because of their large financial investment. When you first bought this farm, you buy this farm, it's kind of old. They need 20% down. So we, out of money, we had to find some money. <laughs> we, we take our own. Yeah, we, we withdraw all my retirement, 401k, 401k, 401k to uh, withdraw all those and pay all the penalty money to uh, make the money down on this poultry farm. So it's kind of hard. In the economies go up, everything up, but the poultry is the, you know, the, the money for the poultry is not everything. The pound of chicken still like when we first start a five cent, it's still right there. And that will be the chance for us for, I would say, for the next five years. Because if the economies go up, the inflation up, but nothing, the poultry, you know, nothing, then we won't not be able to survive. Back 2009, uh, 2009, and all the USDA showing that we have well over 600 long family who purchased chicken farm in the state from Missouri, Arkansas, they try to stay here. Mostly migrated in 2004, 2006, seven slowed down, eight, nine, it kind of slowed down. I could be wrong, but by the number that I look at in the farm that I was help from by the end of the decade if 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 50 percent of the all those that survive this is a miracle it is very important that we know and appreciate these farmers whether they are Hmong whether they are Anglo whether they are black or Hispanic we must pay attention to what they do because when they fail our agriculture fail and when agriculture fails, our economy fails. And when all that happens, America suffers. It is just as simple as that. A success story for the Hmong has been their involvement in the Northwest Arkansas farmers markets. Initially, it started as a supplemental income for many, but has grown substantially. The competitive spirit and willingness of the Hmong to work hard have created vibrant farmers markets throughout Northwest Arkansas. Tuli's mother was the one who originally got the idea to participate in the farmers market. She loves to raise chickens and uh, produce, but she's an older lady, so we didn't help her out, but when she went to the uh, farmer's market, she made like $30, $40, she was very happy. My wife and I, we went to help her, and I said, well, we can change this, Mom. Well, as one vendor put it, they've raised the bar, and by that he means the American Hmong people have a large quantity of top quality produce all through the season. Their farms have the capacity to be growing large amounts of produce, and that's what we're gonna need in the future when gasoline gets too expensive to truck it all in from California. We'll need to grow it here for the people who live here, and I think their success will be critical to whether we're able to feed ourselves in Northwest Arkansas. The Hmong culture has many qualities in common with the best in the American way of life, 
a strong work ethic, independence of character and the desire to be one's own boss, a competitive entrepreneurial spirit, and a belief in the importance of the family, loyalty, honesty, trustworthiness, and education. The Ozark Hmong are also extremely loyal to the United States. We needed to do many things to improve that we are a good people, such as, number one, we need to be good citizens for the nation and support the government of the United States. But the Hmong way of life has many unique qualities as well, particularly their clan structure, shamanistic religion, and colorful traditions based on their agrarian past. There are only 18 surnames or clans in the U.S., which are also seen as extended families. A person cannot marry someone with the same clan name as theirs, for example, even though they may not be related. And the members of the clan are called brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles. The social support provided by the families is important for keeping the culture. My plan was, when my parents moved down here, it was I was going to stay up there, and go to college up there because, you know, I was a good student, but plans didn't work out. I didn't, I, I didn't feel right being up there without the family. So I moved, I moved down here too. Many children no longer speak Hmong and are not learning the old traditional ways, but that often depends on whether there has been a close family member to teach them. My older two raised my dad by my parents and they speak and understand Hmong really well. My baby, we, bring him we down here when he was two years old so he was like mostly by us and my, my two older ones so 90 percent of the time he heard english not in not mom my grandma's always been that person that per, that person that kind of keeps me back to my roots she's the one that kind of reminded me where i came from my culture my religion my language so once she's there at the house we keep that language there because she doesn't speak English. Use the ritual that we use for our ancestor. Then we will do every new year. My dad can only do it, and my brother cannot do it neither. So like him, he, his dad's not there to teach him, so he doesn't have anybody to learn from. Nowadays, it's just like a improvised version of our culture, and it, I, I really think it's being yeah, diluted and the students I know we're really trying our best to not let that happen but we really can't learn all of it either and we, we, we really rely on the older generation to actually teach us and and we we listen but sometimes it, it, it's, it's like it's like cl like the clash of the moment in the American culture again. And often there is a conflict between the old ways practiced at home and their life as an American young person. When I live out here, I'm like as Americanized as I am, but when I go back home, there's respect for everything. Like you gotta respect your parents and, well that's not really a, an issue, but the, my mom's a shaman and I have, I have to do a lot of things that that most kids won't, don't have to do. And I know I question sometimes too, it's like, do I really have to do this? I mean, we're in America now and things are different, laws are different, and I really love our culture. It's unique, it's rich, but is it what I want for me and for my kids? And I, I think that's what everyone asks themselves, every younger generation asks themselves. I mean, gen next generation will disappear and that's okay for me because this is not a Hmong country or this is not a Laos anymore this is the United States so my kids generation will never speak Hmong anymore will change another change that immigration brought is that women are better educated younger women especially are becoming more assertive among the traditionally male decision makers that back in Laos, the women follow the rule, obey the obey the man. I'm I'm grow up in um, United States, but I brought as a more traditional Hmong woman, and I, I obey my husband. I do a lot of things like my my mom taught me. You as a woman, you have to play the role of woman. You have to be a good mom, be a good role model for your kid. Men still the spring, 
power and make the final decision. <clears throat> like my family here, well, my wife, she's a breadwinner, but every decision that has to be made, it has to come to me. Uh, all the community would not accept if I do not uh, make the decision. And, and uh, still going on with the whole community too. Younger generation, it's about even. Now today, all the Hmong girls got to go to school because right now we're in the United States and every child has to go to school. And more women get education, higher education than the boys now today in the Hmong culture. Hmong people have mostly intermarried among themselves for cultural reasons. Yet more are marrying outside of the culture with the assimilation into American life. You really want someone who understands you and who's, who's actually been through it too and who's, who, who's heard the stories and who, who's done it, you know? So I guess it's really important to marry a Hmong girl and start a family with them. T to be honest, my daughter came and asked me, I said, I, I, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. But the son-in-law, whatever I tell him, he better do it. Now, for that being said, I, I would prefer my kids to marry within the Hmong community. In, in the Hmong culture, when the parents have something to do, they say, and a son-in-law better show up and do it. Uh, I'm not sure of the culture if I could do that to uh, my son-in-law or not. Uh, for us, love, it doesn't matter what color, uh, what, what language, who you are. As long as you love each other, you work things out, will be great. So by, by racial or by marriage, it's not a problem for, for us, for me, or for him. But for older generation, for my parents, yes, it's really hard. The Hmong culture will always be uh, will always be with me. Like I'm a big, I love my culture, I love my language. That will, that's something that I will never throw away. I think a little bit of all of us want to keep our culture alive. You know, some of my friends can't speak it, but they still wear clothes to the new year. They still, you know, they still eat Hmong food. And I think, I think we're trying, like we, we want to keep our culture. It's just, um, it's just kind of, it's, it's moving out of us. I, th I think because it's not, we're, we're not bracing enough of it or something. The Hmong Association exists to retain the culture, but it depends on volunteers and doesn't have the budget to provide for many of the cultural and social needs of the Ozark Hmong community. Because each president, they run only two years. They work only two years, and the next president, they. They, they begin the, the work again and again. So when they got experience and they quit, we try to uh, get some funding to serve the people, uh, like uh, employment or somebody who need like a transportation or in, uh, interpretation or translation. But in Arkansas, it's hard to um, get funding from the states or federal. And now we just uh, do uh, some fundraising, like a uh, year by year, and to keep our office open. The association sponsors the Hmong New Year celebration to help preserve traditions. In Laos, these celebrations allowed young people from different clans to meet and eventually marry. The ball toss was the principal courting ritual, for example. Yet in the United States, options for young people to meet are greater, and the ball toss has lost much of its meaning. I think a lot of it down here is there's not a lot of people doing it, so you don't want to be the only one doing it. I think if everybody decided, oh, you know, come together, let's do it, then I think it will be a little bit more successful. In addition, the Hmong New Year celebration in the Ozarks has combined two events that Hmong in other parts of the country celebrate separately. The New Year with its traditions from Laos and a large scale soccer tournament for the July 4th celebration. This has diluted the old New Year traditions for the Ozark Hmong, especially for the young people. So a lot of the kids actually, when they go to the New Year's, they go and play sport. So they don't really wear, it's just too much of a house, so to wear Hmong clothes and then go play sports because you're changing in and out of it. In early 2011, the icon of Hmong culture in the United States, General Vang Pao, passed away at the age of 81. It is too soon to tell the effects of his passing on Hmong communities throughout the country, but the Ozark Hmong community will continue to struggle to assert their identity and preserve their culture. Eventually we'll get 
well, the population will grow larger and then hopefully they'll get to know who we are. I know everyone doesn't know us yet, but you know, just one, one step at a time and, and at least a small group knows us and then they'll, they'll spread the word and then, and then once that word gets out, every, everyone will know about the Hmong people. I fear that we will maybe in the next hundred years, nobody will know the Hmong. Uh, they don't know the, the, the story that we, uh, we are from. Like a General Wang Pao, he say, if my generation passed away, and how can you tell that we have some value that we did and good thing uh, to help the American people?